So let's get started. Um, hello everyone, uh, this is Dr. Singharu, uh, your pediatrics faculty. Um, I'll be discussing the INICT SS 2023 recall questions in this particular session. Uh, before I get started, this time the exam difficulty was of the usual level where uh, moderate to tough questions were there. And source of most of the questions were from um, Nelson textbook of pediatrics only. I have selected few questions for discussion today. You can also contribute the missing options or can complete the question uh, if you can recall at any point of time. So we will try to discuss um, the question format as well as approach to the question in this particular section. Mainly I'll be discussing about uh, the super um, the super specialty questions asked in the section of general pediatrics and few miscellaneous topics as well. So let us get started with the first question. Okay, so this is a question about short stature question, which is um, about um, a child who is having dysmorphic facies along with the short limbs, um, baseline, low baseline IGF, insulin like growth factor is low. Along with that, there's a normal growth hormone stimulation test. That is what this question says. And you can see that um, options are given like Leron syndrome, achondroplasia, Turner syndrome and Nolan syndrome. So all the conditions given in the option can be associated with short stature. But this is something related to growth hormone section. That is why uh, IGF as well as growth hormone stimulation testings are being shown in this particular question. Now, out of this, Leron syndrome will be the best answer for this particular question because you all know that Leron syndrome is a condition of growth hormone receptor defect. Growth hormone receptor defect where the growth hormone is not able to cause its action. So the point is growth hormone gets secreted from the pituitary but it's not able to cause action resulting in growth. So the answer is going to be Leron syndrome. Now the point to be noted in Leron syndrome are it's a mutation of the growth hormone receptor. There are some MCQ points here also. Growth hormone receptor has three type of proteins, uh, three type of domains actually, intracellular domain, extracellular domain, as well as the uh, transmembrane domain. And Leron syndrome, the growth hormone receptor defect is in the extracellular domain. This is important, extracellular domain. Okay, right? And also, you can see that the growth hormone level tends to be high. Why? Because the growth hormone is not able to exert its action due to the receptor problem. So as a feedback, growth hormone secretion tends to high, but growth will not occur due to the resistance to the action of growth hormone. So insulin-like growth factor levels are low. That is something which is very important because the mediator of effects of growth hormone or insulin-like growth factor, one only, which is not able to get released from the liver because the growth hormone is not able to produce its effect. So IGF-1 levels are low. In a case of typical growth hormone deficiency, you all know that IGF-1 will be low as well as growth hormone levels also will be low. So both will be low in case of a typical growth hormone deficiency. But in Leron syndrome, there's only resistance. So growth hormone tends to be high even after stimulation also, even in the resting state also. And IGF-1 levels are going to be low. Then in this particular condition, recombinant human insulin-like growth factor 1 is useful in the management. Because the IGF-1 levels are low, you can use the recombinant form of IGF-1. This may be a future question also possible for your exams. It's called mecca sermon. It is called as a mecca sermon. So that is about this particular condition. You can notice the answer will be Leron syndrome. Okay. Other conditions like achondroplasia, Turner syndrome, Nonan syndrome are no way associated with uh, this growth hormone condition. So that all can be ruled out. Okay. So this was one question. Second, there were good number of questions from the section of Down syndrome actually. If you have any doubts in this, you can just let me know. If there are any doubts, you can let me know. Okay, so moving on to the next question. Down syndrome is usually caused by an error in which of the following um, steps of cell division? It's a very straightforward question. Most of you know the answer also and it's a repeatedly asked question. It's a meiotic non-distinction, okay? You all know about it. It's a meiotic non-distension, usually occurring in the maternal side. It usually occurs in the maternal side. It's a maternal meiotic non-distension. Okay, right. You all know about it. It's involving the chromosome number 21 and it accounts for 95 percentage cases of Down syndrome. This is a pretty straightforward question about Down syndrome. The next question about Down syndrome is a little bit uh, in-depth question. It was about a Down syndrome counseling session based on the risk. 
mother had T20 21, 2121 translocation. You all know that this is a type of Robertsonian translocation. Correct? Robertsonian translocation. This is a type of Robertsonian translocation. Now, the problem with the Robertsonian translocation in one of the parents of a child with Down syndrome is that it increases the risk of occurrence of Down syndrome in a pregnancy. Increased risk of occurrence of Down syndrome in a pregnancy. We all know that the general risk of Down syndrome, the general risk of Down syndrome in a population will be 1 to 4 percentage. This is the usual risk, 1 to 4 percent. That 4 percent risk will be something when the maternal age is more than 35 years of age. Okay, right? However, if it is associated with Robertson and translocation apparel, then the risk is increased. What is the answer for the question? Yes, anybody can answer this. What is the answer for this particular question? 2121 translocation. Yes. Very correct. Uh, yes, doctors, correct. It's a correct answer. It is 100 percentage risk. That's the correct statement. It is associated with 100 percent risk. So every pregnancy is going to be associated with uh, fetus with a Down syndrome. Okay, that's a very correct answer. It's a 100 percent risk of this particular condition, which will be noted. Okay, right. So that should be remembered. 100 percent risk is noted. Okay, right. Now there is one more translocation also associated with Robertson in translocation only, which is P1421 translocation. If it is 1421 translocation, it is generally lesser risk, but more risk compared to the general risk. How much? It's usually in the range of 5 to 7 percentage. It is usually in the range of 5 to 7 percentage. So for this particular question, it was 2121 translocation associated with 100 percent risk of Down syndrome. Okay, right. So that was this particular question. You can see here, translocation 2121 carriers have a 100% recurrent risk for a chromosomally abnormal child, whereas translocation 1421 have a 5 to 7% recurrent risk when transmitted by females. Okay, right? Can you see that, right? So this is 100%, 2121 and 1421 it is 5 to 7%. It's an important question, probably one of the previous questions as well and to look forward in future as well. Okay, so that's about this particular question. Then this was one question where I need your inputs because this was something which we could not get a very clear question. Even after the session is over, you can share your contribution towards this particular question or alter the options also. Down syndrome child with a bradyarrhythmia and was a typical clinical scenario type question. Heart rate is 48 and ECG shows probably some heart block. History of previous heart surgery and the child is having hypothyroidism on l -droxin. What should be the most appropriate management? I could not get a, uh, a correct version of this particular question because as such, Heart block association with Down syndrome is very, very less. Down syndrome usually has heart defects in the form of endocardial cushion defects, uh, as well as mm, the ASDs, as well as PDA like that. But it is not particularly associated with heart block. So I feel that in this particular question, probably it's a result of the heart surgery. Child could have developed some problem with the heart blocks. Uh, if any of you have the actual stem of the question, you can please contribute. Any of you? Want to contribute to this particular question? Okay. As such, the answer for this particular question uh, depends on the correct wordings of the question. So, mm -hmm. temporary pacemaker, permanent pacemaker should be one of that particular answers. Titrate antioxidant may not be required because it's a case of bradyarrhythmia. So, I don't feel that it's an answer for this particular question. So, answer should be one of this uh, pacemaker. Okay. Any answers? Anybody can contribute to this? Okay, as of now, I'll keep the answer for this question as um, yes, permanent pacemaker for this particular question because the child is having a definite evidence of heart block. Um, you know that it can be intravenous or transcutaneous pacemaker insertion. That will be the answer for the question. But any modifications uh, are welcome from your side. So moving on to the next question. Okay. This is yet another interesting question as well as a repeatedly asked exam question. Five-year-old child is presenting with steatoria, failure to thrive, ataxia, peripheral neuritis and retinitis pigmentosa. Uh, I just wanted to tell one thing that there were good number of questions related to this steatoria as well as chronic diarrhea or something related to the malabsorption section of pediatrics. Good number of questions were uh, actually asked in this exam. So I uh, suggest all of you to go through that full chapter in Nelson textbook of pediatrics because future questions are also expected from the same section of malabsorption. Okay, right. So this was 
steatoria, which is indicating fat malabsorption, failure to thrive as a part of systemic illness, ataxia, peripheral neuritis, and retinitis pigmentosa. You can see that. Black smear reveals acanthocytosis. This is an important, important clue in this question. Serum chemistries reveal decreased levels of cholesterol and triglyceride and absent serum beta lipoprotein. Of the following, the most likely diagnosis is. Any comments, anybody? What is the most likely diagnosis in this particular question? The key, fa key words in this question I have already marked. One is teotoria, second is acanthocytosis, and third is the serum blood chemistry reports. What is that? Low levels of cholesterol, decreased levels of cholesterol, triglyceride, as well as absent beta lipoproteins. Anybody wants to answer this? A beta lipoproteinia, heart numb disease, Repsom disease, Frederick ataxia. See, for Frederick ataxia, other than the presence of ataxia, there is nothing else to suggest the diagnosis. So we can rule out that option. Repsom disease will have an entirely different set of uh, presentation. It's a, a peroxisomal disorder. We all know about it. So that is no way related to acanthocytosis as well as steatoria. So that can be ruled out uh, for Repsom disease. Heart temp disease, you all know that it's a condition characterized by decreased, defi uh, decreased levels of neutral amino acids. You know that the amino acid levels, especially the neutral amino acid levels will be decreased. So this condition is actually associated with decreased levels of tryptophan. And because of decreased levels of tryptophan, there will be decreased levels of niacin. So this condition would present like pelagra-like symptoms, okay, right? It would not present like ataxia, peripheral neuritis, or steatoria. So what will be the answer for the question? It is going to be a beta lipoproteinemia. Okay. This is one of the important questions that A beta lipoproteinemia uh, fills all the particular um, findings given in this question. Okay. Now, a quick look about A beta lipoproteinemia. It's a disorder which is autosomal recessive disorder of lipoprotein metabolism. Okay. Autosomal recessive disorder of lipoprotein metabolism. But what happens is that there is a decreased triglyceride transport across the intestine. Decreased triglyceride transport across the intestine. This is the basic problem in this particular condition. And these children have steatoria since birth itself, which is one of the earliest manifestations of this particular condition. And this condition is associated with peripheral neuropathy, which typically manifests as decreased deep tendon reflexes. This is important, decreased deep tendon reflexes. And this is actually a part of decreased levels of a fat-soluble vitamin. What is that fat-soluble vitamin? Decrease of which can result in peripheral neuropathy. Any comments? Anybody wants to contribute? What is the reason for perif uh, peripheral neuropathy manifestation in this particular condition? Anybody? You can type in your answers. Okay, it is due to decreased levels of vitamin E. One of the fat-soluble vitamin which is deficient in this particular condition. Okay. And as the child grows older, this condition also is characterized by involvement of posterior column. So thereby the sensations tends to get decreased. Cerebellum is affected. So these children can have ataxia, basal ganglia. So extraperonal movements and tremors can also occur in this particular condition. So neurological manifestations are very important part of this particular condition. Okay. Then this condition due to prolonged vitamin E deficiency itself can be associated with atypical retinitis pigmentosa. Okay, so if you see in this particular question, can you see all the features were given in this? Can you see that peripheral neuritis, steatoria, retinitis pigmentosa, all are very classical of A beta lipoproteinemia. Okay, right. Then the diagnosis of this particular condition is suggested by the presence of acanthocyte, which was also given in this particular question. Along with that, there is extremely low levels of cholesterol. This is yet another important finding. Okay, right. Due to I told you, the triglyceride transport is affected in this condition. So what is going to be the problem? That there will be decreased levels of serum cholesterol. It will be very, very low. In fact, it is less than 50 milligram per deciliter is the level of cholesterol in this patient. Triglyceride levels are also very, very less, less than 20. Okay. As well as there is very, very low levels of VLDL. And the next important thing is there is virtually absent LDL cholesterol. This is an important question to look for in your upcoming exams. This is important. LDL is virtually absent in this particular condition of A beta lipoproteinemia. Okay, right? So that should be remembered. Okay, right. So that's about this particular question. Answer for which is A beta lipoproteinemia. It was a clinical scenario type question. 
um, what I observed from the recall is that there were good number of clinical scenario questions, but it was little lesser compared to the previous exams. Around 30% of the questions were clinical scenario, remaining were like direct question, like the investigation of choice, in which condition is the radiological finding seen, like that were the question. But 30% of the questions were definitely clinical scenario question. And you know that clinical scenario questions are the ones which will ultimately decide your marks in this type of exam, competitive exam. So it is very, it's very, very important that you should get, um, that you should practice these type of questions um, to get through with a good score in these type of exams. Okay, right. Okay, we move on to the next condition. Next is two questions about um, inheritance pattern. These were actually very straightforward questions. Okay, very, very straightforward questions. Um, you must be knowing already the list of autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, as well as X-linked conditions. Please go through that list the day before the exams because uh, even last year, INISS also, last sorry, last INISS also, we had a good number of questions regarding the inheritance pattern of the usual conditions. Okay, right? So, anybody wants to answer this? Inherited condition with mostly autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance. Straight question. I don't think explanations and all is needed. Yes. Anybody wants to answer this? Which of the following conditions has an autosomal dominant pattern of inheritance? Among the retinoblastoma, xeroderma pigmentosa, as well as ataxia telangiectasia. Anybody? You can comment your answers. Yes. Anybody wants to answer this? Retinoblastoma. Okay, so the answer for this question is retinoblastoma. This is the autosomal dominant condition. There is xeroderma pigmentosa and ataxia telangiectasia or autosomal recessive conditions. Okay, right. So that should be remembered. Okay, so that will be for this question. Yet another question based on the pattern of inheritance only. Which of these is autosomal recessive pattern of inheritance? That was the question. Ataxia telangiectasia, tuberous sclerosis, and Pudes Jagger syndrome. Yes, any comments on this? Anybody wants to answer this? Which of these is having an autosomal uh, recessive mode of inheritance? Yeah. Autosomal recessive mode of inheritance? Yes. It is a case of ataxia telangiectasia. Ataxia telangiectasia is autosomal recessive mode of inheritance. That should be remembered. AR, ataxia telangiectasia. It's an autosomal recessive form of inheritance. Okay. That should be remembered. So again, telling you, please. Keep that list of inherited condition, examples of inherited condition, autosomal, X-linked, as well as mitochondrial inheritances ready. The day before the exam, you have to go through that list because good number of questions are directly picked up from that list itself. Okay, right. Moving on to the next question. Incorrect chromosomal pattern among the following. This is a very straightforward question. Okay, right. Anybody wants to comment on this? You all know that. We'll go from the last options. Okay. Turner syndrome is 45 XO. Absolutely a correct chromosomal pattern. Kleine Center syndrome 47XXY. That's also absolutely a correct statement. Swiver syndrome. Anybody want to comment on this? What is Swiver syndrome? Swiver syndrome. Yes, it's a pure gonadal dysgenesis condition. It's a pure gonadal dysgenesis condition. Which is associated with 46XY only. That is correct statement. Okay. Pure gonadal dysgenesis condition. What about the next one? Mayer Rocky Tansky Kusner Hauser syndrome. Yes, you all know that it's a condition characterized by uh, defective development of uterus as well as the, yes, upper two third of the vagina. Correct. So this condition is seen in which gender? Yes, it's a female gender. So is it going to be 46XY? It's absolutely wrong. It is not 46XY. It is going to be 46X6. Okay, because it's a female which is affected in case of mayer rookie transi husna hauser syndrome. Okay, right? So that's an incorrect chromosomal pattern. Okay, I hope that is clear. Okay, so this was a match type of question where you have to find out the incorrect matching in chromosomal pattern. Okay, that was very straightforward. Moving on to the next question. This is a, a scenario type question, a short scenario type question where it was given short stature ASD with the following finding. Two options were given, Ellis von Krivel syndrome and holt oram syndrome. Um, yes, anybody? Is it Ellis von Krivel or holt oram syndrome? Any comments? What is your observation from that particular picture? You can see that instead of five fingers, this child is having a 
six fingers. Can you see that? This is the additional finger which we are noticing here. What is that actually? Pre-axial or post-axial polydactyly. This is nothing but post-axial polydactyly. Correct. It's a post-axial polydactyly. Okay. Are you able to follow this? Okay. So this is post-axial polydactyly. Okay. So now try to tell me which condition is that. There is also one more ASC close given. What is that? It is a case of Ellis von Krivald syndrome. This is very important. It's a case of Ellis von Krivald syndrome. Ellis von Krivald syndrome is famously remembered like this chondro ectodermal dysplasias. Chondro ectodermal dysplasias. Chondro actually refers to the skeletal manifestation. Like, for example, you are seeing in this particular question. Um, post-axial polydactyly along with the short stature, they typically have short limbs as well. Ectrodermal refers to a finding which is already there in this particular picture itself. Can anybody tell the answer for that? What is that finding? It is the nails which are abnormal looking nails. What is that? Nail dysplasia is a typical chondroectrodermal ectoderm dysplasia manifestation noted in this particular condition. Okay, so that is Ellis von Krivan symptom. Okay, right? And heart disease association already given in the question. It is atrial septal defect. What about Holtoram syndrome? Holtoram syndrome can also have short stature and atrial septal defect, but it will not be associated with the polydactyly. In Holtoram syndrome, you will get which association? Yes, in Holtoram syndrome, the association is for can everybody answer this? In Holtoram syndrome, what is the skeletal association? It will be in the form of limb defect like absent thumb, absent thumb or radial defects can be associated in this particular condition. Okay, right? It is not associated with polydactyly. Okay, so that is why um, the answer for this question is going to be Ellis von Krivald syndrome. Okay, right. Moving on to the next one. Hollow prosencephaly is associated with Okay, right. It was a very famous question. I think it's a repeat question from one of your previous INASS exams only. Can anybody um, answer this particular one? Hollow prosencephaly is associated with. It's one of the CNS malformations. We all know about it. Sony H pathway, RAS map key pathway, and mTOR pathway. Yes, any comments? It is a case of so. It is an answer of Sony H hog path. That is the answer for this particular question. And the gene correspondingly is called as a S. H, H, G. S for Sonic, H for H, and F for the another H. So that is the S, H, H, S, H, H uh, gene defect. Okay, right? So this is a straightforward one, which was taken from directly from the Nelson textbook of pediatrics. If you see in the first um, chapter of uh, nervous system itself, there are uh, compilations of gene defects along with the neurological malformations which are given. Please go through that list. In that list, SHH gene is clearly given as an association with hollow prosencephaly. Please remember there are so many um, so many genes associated with hollow prosencephaly. Nelson mentions at least 12 genes are associated with hollow prosencephaly, but SHH is the most important gene associated with hollow prosencephaly. Okay, that should be remembered. We'll move to the next one. Um, this was a question which we are not sure whether the actual question was like this, but this was the stem of the question, any modifications are welcome from those who have attended the exam. Eight month old child having a child, eight month old child having a developmental delay along with a thin brown hair. Image of that thin hair with breaks in the hair were given. What is the deficiency? It was probably a case of Menke disease. That's what is my conclusion. If there are any modification, you can please let me know. Was there any modification in the question? You can put it up in the chat box or in the Q&A section of your um, of that webinar. I'll be able to read it. Okay. Yes. Okay. It was more or less the same type of question. Okay. So the problem was it's a neurological manifestations were noted. That is why there is developmental delay noted in this condition. Along with that, hair problems also, typically in the form of kinky hair. That's why it gets the name as Menke's kinky hair disease. You all know about it. It's called as a Menke's kinky hair disease, which is due to copper deficiency, right? It is due to copper deficiency. Uh, it is due to impaired transport of copper across the intestine. This particular condition is going to occur. And what is the gene defect in this particular condition? The gene defect in this condition 
Yes, that's also a very famous question. Yes, what is the gene defect? It is ATP7A defect. Don't forget, ATP7V defect is associated with Wilson's disease. Okay, that should not be forgotten. Okay, bye. Anything else? Okay, this condition, there can be one more question also, which is one of your previous year questions. The hair microscopy, hair microscopy will show something like this. Suppose this is the hair microscopy, which I'm drawing like this. You will see some breaks in the hair shaft, okay, which is called as a fracture of the shaft of the hair. Along with that, there will be some swollen appearance noted in this area. That is why this is also called trichorexis. Trichorexis nodosa. Please remember this. It's also called as trichorexis nodosa. Trico here refers to the hair appearance. Rexis refers to the splitting or the fracture. Nodosa refers to the swelling. These are all some of the important one line of points related to Menke's disease that you should keep a note of. We'll move to the next one. It was a question about developmental milestones. Okay, it was a very straightforward question. This, I think, many of you should be able to answer it without any much difficulty. Child is able to run, make a tower of four blocks, make a horizontal line, but no circular stroke. What should be the age of the child? That is the developmental age of the child. Anybody wants to attempt this particular question? Yes, milestone question. Tower of four blocks, horizontal line, but no circular stroke. What is the age of the child? Yes, everything fitting into 18 months of age. It is 18 months of age. You know that running is attained by 18 months of age. Tower of 3 to 4 blocks is also by 18 months of age. Horizontal line is by 18 months of age. Don't forget, vertical strokes is by vertical strokes is by 2 years. And also, child should be able to make a uh, tower of 5 to 6 blocks. This is important. 5 to 6 blocks by the age of 2 years. So, some of you were confused whether it was 2 years or 18 months of age. So, that is why I'm trying to Differentiate between the two things. Uh, yes, Dr. Shahan, that is correct. Answer is 18 months of age. Okay, answer is 18 months of age. Okay, right. So this was a straightforward question from developmental milestone. Obviously, at any level of exam you appear for, developmental milestone is something which is very, very important. Okay, every exam you'll have, you'll have a good number of questions from the developmental milestone section. Okay, so that was also asked in this exam. Okay, then one more question. In the management of SMA, that is spinal muscular atrophy, New C nursing is administered by which route? Yes. You all know that spinal muscular atrophy, there are a lot of new treatments which are available, which are covered in the main lectures. This time, they asked about the question of new C nursing administered by which route? If I am not mistaken, it came in one of the exams, not the same question, but new C nursing is useful in the management of. Like that, one of your previous questions was asked. This time, they asked about more route of administration of new C nursing. First of all, now what is nucinescent? It's an antisense oligonucleotide. Antisense oligonucleotide, which is useful in the management of spinal muscular atrophy. You all know about it. Anybody wants to answer this? Okay. Yes. Anybody wants to answer this question? Which route is it administered? This is going to be a definite topic in your upcoming INASS exams also. So please make sure you know about it. Okay, I'll tell the answer here. It is intrathecal root. It's going to be intrathecal root. Okay, so that is very important. Okay, so the administration into the CSF, that is where it is going, uh, that's how it's going to be administered. Few points about nucinacin, as I already told you, it is one of the antisense oligonucleotides, works by exon skipping therapy. Exon skipping therapy. I'm just telling here the main points only. The details you can look up from the main lectures. It's a, one of the important new treatments in your um, spinal muscular atrophy. The next point about this is it can be used in all types of SMA patients. You know that there are different types of SMA. In all the types of SMA, this can be useful. Now, one more important thing is another therapeutic approach is gene therapy. This is also a recent advance, which may be a potential question in the future. Um, second recent advanced treatment in spinal muscular atrophy is gene therapy using AAV9. What is that? It is adenovirus associated vector 9. So the keyword here is adenovirus. Okay, right? This is one more new treatment. Okay, right? So please keep a note of this. This is also a topic which can be repeated in future. So that was about this question. 
Then moving on to next question. There were actually two questions. There were two questions about catch up vaccination. I feel that this is a pattern of question for your future exams also. Every level of exam, this type of questions are catch up vaccination, meaning a child who has not been vaccinated before, presenting after a few months or few years, how will you vaccinate? One question was related to 15 month old child, what should be the vaccination? Second one was related to three day old. I, I'm not sure it was three day old or the three year old child because some of the students were saying that three year old child it was. Some students were saying three month old child. But whatever it is, it was uh, related to catch up vaccination. Okay, this is given in our latest edition of Opigai textbook itself. This is the reference. Opigai textbook, this picture is actually given. Uh, first thing is, at the time of evaluation, what you're going to give, then one month, two month, and six month afterwards. Okay, at the time of evaluation, if the child is less than seven years of age, what are they supposed to give at the time of evaluation? First itself, BCG. Okay, OPV, Hepatitis B as well as DPT. All these should be given. BCG, OPV, Hepatitis B and DPT. All of these should be given. Then after one month, what will you give? You are supposed to give OPV, DPT and Hepatitis B. BCG is not repeated, not needed also. You know that it's only one dose. Then after two months, OPV, then measles containing vaccine. This measles containing vaccine would be something like an MMR along with the typhoid vaccine also which is indicated. And after six months, you're going to give the again the boosters like DPT and hepatitis B or the third, I'm sorry, the third dose of DPT as well as the hepatitis B that should be given. Whereas if the child is more than seven years of age, you are going to give hepatitis B along with Tdap. This is what is the initial vaccination you're going to give at the age of if the child is more than seven years old. After one month, you're supposed to give TB and hepatitis B. After two months, you are again going to give measles containing vaccine and typhoid vaccines. Measles vaccine could be MMR. And after six months, you are going to give TB and hepatitis B. Okay, right. So this is the schedule which is related to catch up immunization of a child. Depending on the age of the child, you have to give the vaccines in this schedule. This is yet another important question for your future exams. Then we move to the next one. Fusobacterium necroforum sepsis. Okay, right. I could not get any of the other options, but it was a very clear um, question related to Fusobacterium necroforum. It's one of the relatively rare infections, but it's a dangerous infection. Okay, right. And what is the name of that condition? It is called Lemieux syndrome. It is called as a Lemieux syndrome. Um, I don't know what was the exact question, but the stem of the question was like this, related to Fusobacterium necroforum. Which of the following, um, I mean, con clinical conditions will result. Okay, it's a very important question. Lemieux syndrome is a condition of separative infection of the lateral pharyngeal space, also called as a parapharyngeal space. It's a condition of phlebitis, okay, phlebitis of the internal jugular veins. This is important. It's a phlebitis of the internal jugular veins caused by the bacterium, which is necro, uh, fusobacterium necroforum. Okay, right? And it complicates usually other cause of pharyngitis. For example, child could have developed a viral pharyngitis or bacterial pharyngitis. As a complication of that, this condition can occur. And this condition typically manifests as infection in that lateral pharyngeal space. The characteristic features would include initially pharyngitis and then followed by acutely ill child with a unilateral neck pain. This is the key word, only one side, unilateral neck pain along with swelling. They can also have associated trismus as well as dysphagia also. These are characteristic findings in Lemieux syndrome and Christmas and dysphagia are the other associated findings. And for this particular condition, there is an important complication in the form of septic embolism and this septic embolism goes to the lungs usually. This is also one of your previously asked MCQ questions. Septic embolism in Lemieux syndrome is associated uh, is in which of the following organs it is in the lung area and treatment obviously is going to be the antibiotics uh, the recommended antibiotic is cefoxidin. Cefoxidin is usually useful in the management. You can also use high dose of penicillin, but cefoxidin is a better antibiotic useful in the management of this condition. So please make a note of this. It was about Fusobacterium proforum sepsis, which is Lemieux syndrome. Okay, you can see that these are all specific areas of small, small discussions in Nelson textbook of pediatrics. The thing is, these are all asked in the previous exams also. 
and that is why they are repeatedly asking these questions okay so these type of topics you have to note it and specifically read it from nelson textbook because line to line these are taken from the same textbook okay right so that was this particular question then one more question the mother is on ssra selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors and the baby is having symptoms after birth what is the name of that disorder okay right again options are very incomplete but the correct answer for this question is called neonatal adaptation syndrome okay right this is yet another pattern of question where drug intake in the mother or toxin intake in the mother causing problems in the baby usually your previous questions were related to heart defects associated with drug intake like lithium ftins anomaly so many pattern questions came this time it was something related to ssri intake in the mother what are the problems in the baby it was about neonatal adaptation syndrome actually the exposure to ssri okay in the pregnancy that means mother taking ssri can have the following effects on the baby can you see that it's called neonatal adaptation syndrome actually called poor neonatal adaptation syndrome which is more of a withdrawal effect very important point which is more of a withdrawal effect then persistent pulmonary hypertension they also have increased risk of congenital malformation especially cardiac malformation not any particular cardiac malformation but the use of cardiac malformation like septal defects are associated with this particular condition okay and this time it was about poor neonatal adaptation syndrome okay and this condition usually appears within first 8 hours after birth and often persists for first 2 to 6 days of life okay and the key feature here happens to be appearance within first 8 hours after birth and what are the problem due to this um, withdrawal of ssris it is affecting the neurological system so the child can have something like a poor cry poor cry as well as poor sucky autonomic manifestation like respiratory difficulty can occur respiratory manifestation even uh, transient apnea has been reported and ga manifestations like diarrhea vomiting all these things are there but an important thing is it is not a permanent condition it will usually settle within the first few days after birth itself and very very important point due to this condition no mortality has been reported so far that means that does not occur due to this particular condition that is also an important point to be noted so this is a new question but i think it can be a future pattern of question also related to ssri intake in the mother causing problems in the baby okay right moving on to the next one it was related to current recommendation for treatment of coxella bernetti endocarditis you all know that coxella bernetti is a q fever uh, or causing organism you all know about it as such endocarditis due to this organism is very very less common please keep that in mind but still the question came about this any of you wants to answer this what is the recommendation of treatment it is not about usual streptococcus viridens endocarditis it's a rare condition a usual condition but still important coxella bernetti endocarditis doxy and hydroxy chloroquine doxy cycling benzathione penicillin ceftriaxone for a usual case of endocarditis we will use the ceftriaxone but here what is recommended or penicillin we use but here what is recommended it's going to be one of the two options doxy cycling or doxy cycling and hydroxy chloroquine see if it is a uncomplicated q fever if it is a uncomplicated q fever what is recommended is doxy cycling okay that is what nelson textbook says but if it is associated with endocarditis it should be doxy cycling and hydroxy chloroquine not only that the duration of treatment will be for a long duration around 18 months of treatment is recommended whereas for uncomplicated q fever the duration of treatment is only 2 weeks it is only 2 weeks so this is a rare topic but still asked in the exam so do make a note of it okay now coxella bernetti endocarditis as i told you is a uncommon cause of endocarditis and spread is by contaminated milk okay contaminated milk contaminated milk of the infected animals or contact with the infected animals that is how it is going to spread investigation of choice remember it is endocarditis so we have to depend on the culture generally we say for endocarditis two cultures are recommended or required for making a diagnosis right but here one positive culture that means from a single sample positive culture is obtained that itself is sufficient for diagnosis or you can use serology where we look for elevated ig g antibody but if both are given please choose one positive culture as the best investigation for diagnosis of 
coxilla bernetti endocarditis okay right so that's about this particular question moving on to the next one which of the following condition is associated with rapid onset obesity with skin picking disorder any comments if you can recollect any of the other options also you can please contribute prader willi syndrome angelman syndrome any other okay any other options were given in this particular question anybody wants to contribute rapid onset obesity with the skin picking disorder okay right so anyway there were two clues in the question as you can see it's in directly one is the uh, rapid onset obesity along with that skin picking which condition is that yes okay yes it is prader willi syndrome okay answer is going to be prader willi syndrome that condition is the one which is characterized by obesity short stature skin picking and all angelman syndrome you know that both of them both of these disorders belong to the same category what is the category genomic imprinting disorder correct genomic imprinting disorder correct okay that is fine uh, but among the two prader willi is the answer angelman syndrome you all know that it's uh, characterized by happy puppet right happy puppet meaning these children have a happy predisposition they always look very happy along with that uh, they also have ataxia irregular movements of the limbs so that's why it's called happy puppet syndrome okay whereas this is prader willi syndrome which is the answer for the question see here this is also taken from nelson textbook of pediatrics where consensus diagnostic criteria for prader willi syndrome i have put up some of the important features i'm going to highlight here are one is obesity next is hypotonia third is small genitalia so they will have a delayed puberty okay right and of course they have a low iq or intellectual disability these are the main things in the major criteria and in the minor criteria you should not forget one thing which has been already asked in the exam which is skin picking and along with that very very important is the small hands and feet so i have just tried to highlight some of the important points which can help you in making a diagnosis of prader willi syndrome in a given case scenario there are major minor criteria no doubt about it but please focus on all these points to make a diagnosis if the question is going to be repeated again okay that's about this particular question moving on to the next one in a child with the following finding which hormone deficiency is likely to be associated what is the finding you are seeing in this particular picture it's a very characteristic one what is that yes it is this one what is that single central incisor yes it's a single central incisor and if you want to contribute what could be this condition single central incisor associated with which of the following hormone deficiencies it is growth hormone deficiency okay single central incisors are suggestive of growth hormone deficiency and it is along and it is associated with few of the gene defects also important important gene defect is again s h h gene defect this is very important s h h gene defects this is very important okay right now if you see that s h h gene it is associated with one more thing also i told you before what was that hollow prosencephaly association also in fact many cases of pituitary defects pituitary defects s h h g is also associated so please keep a note of this this is important single central incisor okay it is associated with growth hormone deficiency you all know the other features of growth hormone deficiency the child will have a doll like face correct doll like face with the uh, cheeks becoming very chubby and all so doll like face is an important feature bone age will be delayed so that is what i have written as retarded bone age along with that they have dentition delay as well as delayed puberty also these are other associations of growth hormone deficiency but it was a picture based question this time it's straight forward one it is growth hormone deficiency okay right then next question was a very straight forward question few questions in the section of uh, nutrition disorders is what i'm discussing now castles necklace due to deficiency of it's a very straight forward question all of you know this what is that yes it's a case of niacin deficiency you all know about it niacin deficiency causes uh, pellagra and that pellagra is the one which is associated with castles necklace you all must be knowing about the castles necklace which is the uh, the sun exposed area in the neck region showing this erythematous rash and that is what is associated with pellagra or niacin deficiency it's a very straight forward question i'm not going to discuss more about this okay right then one more question was related to acrodermatitis enteropathica this is a very straight forward question i think it was a very simple straight forward one liner question only it is due to which deficiency it is due to 
zinc deficiency? That was a very straightforward question. You all know that acrodermatitis enteropathica, what are all the previous questions? The gene defect. Gene defect is SNC39 A4 gene defect, number one. It's an autosomal recessive disorder. That was a previous question. Associated decreased zinc absorption. Associated with decreased zinc absorption. These are some of the important points related to acrodermatitis enteropathica, which I'm sure all of you should be knowing about this by this time. Okay, it's a very, very important topic at any level of exam, be it NEAT or INASS, you should be knowing about this. Moving on to the next question. Selenium deficiency typically manifests as which of the following manifestations? This I am expecting some of the answers from your side. Can you read that? Selenium deficiency typically manifests as Selenium deficiency typically manifests as which of the following manifestations? Cardiomyopathy, peripheral neuropathy or alopecia? Yes, very good. The answer is going to be cardiomyopathy. And any of you can name, what is the name of this disease called as? It's called Keshan's disease. It is called as a Keshan's disease. Okay, Keshan's disease. That's a typical feature of uh, selenium deficiency. Okay, not a very common condition, but still important for your exam purposes. See, basically, the role of selenium is that it acts as an enzyme cofactor and decreases the oxidative damage in the cells. That is an important point. Oxidative damage in the cells. Okay. Selenium deficiency only typically manifests as cardiomyopathy and excess of selenium is also associated with a garlic odor. It's associated with garlic odor as well as GA effects also. Garlic odor due to excess selenium was one of your previous questions. So I'm putting important for that particular statement. So this is also Important related to selenium deficiency, which was one, uh, selenium excess. Okay, right. Actual question was selenium deficiency manifest as cardiomyopathy. That should be clear. Okay. Then one more question. Again, a very straightforward question. Which of the following vitamin toxicity is associated with increased risk for patients on anticoagulation therapy? B12, E, C, and D. Which one? This is bleeding risk in a patient on anticoagulants. Any answer? It is uh, vitamin E toxicity. I'm sorry for that. It is vitamin E toxicity. It is vitamin E toxicity. Can any of you give an explanation for this? Why vitamin E toxicity should be associated with increased bleeding risk? Yes, any comments? See, it's very simple. Anticoagulation. For example, warfarin. Warfarin. Patient is taking warfarin. Along with that, there is excess of vitamin E. See, excess of vitamin E usually occurs as excess supplementation of vitamin E. That is what is happening. Okay, right? Suppose vitamin E plus warfarin, what does it do? It increases the vitamin K antagonism. Okay, vitamin K antagonism. And you all know that whenever there is antagonism of vitamin K, that is going to result in bleeding manifestation. Correct. Okay, that is the reason for bleeding in case of vitamin E toxicity, which was one of the questions this time. Okay, so vitamin E toxicity, it is due to excess of vitamin supplementation, as I have already told you. Other complications in addition to bleeding would include GI manifestation like again vomiting diarrhea along with that emotional lability also. One of your previous year questions in vitamin E was related to uh, okay I'll just quickly finish this. Treatment of this condition is you have to restrict the vitamin E supplementation in that particular patient or in severe cases you can give you can give vitamin K also because vitamin K is the one which undergoes antagonism in this condition so vitamin K can be given as a treatment in vitamin E toxicity. The previous question which came about vitamin E deficiency was what is a uh, where it is noted vitamin E deficiency? It is noted in preterm babies because preterm babies have a limited transfer of vitamin E from the mother through placenta. That is why vitamin E deficiency usually occurs in preterm babies which needs to be supplemented as well. And how does vitamin E deficiency present? It typically presents as hemolytic anemia between 4 to six weeks after birth. This is one of your previous questions related to vitamin E deficiency. Okay, right? Please make a note of it. Then we move on to the next question. Congestive heart failure like features in refeeding syndrome are due to deficiency of which of the following? Thiamine um, phosphate, sorry, it is phosphate, magnesium, and potassium. Anybody wants to answer this? It's a very straightforward one. Thiamine, phosphate, magnesium, and phosphate. And, and potassium. Which one? CHF light features are due to. Yes. You all know that refeeding syndrome is a condition which occurs 
um, in the setting of severe malnutrition, when you start feeding these patients with high calorie foods from the beginning, this condition is going to occur. High calorie feed to a child who is having severe acute malnutrition, this free feeding syndrome can occur. Anybody wants to comment? Due to deficiency, what? Yes, it is phosphate. In fact, hypophosphatemia is considered as the hallmark feature of refeeding syndrome. Okay, that is something which should be remembered. Now, quick points about refeeding syndrome. It occurs in malnourished individuals as a result of untimely, overzealous oral, enteral, or parental feeds. Can you see that? And it is basically related to high calories. That is what I told you. And onset typically occurs 24 to 48 hours after you give feeds to this particular child. That is when it is going to start. And this particular condition is characterized by breathlessness, rapid pulse, increased venous pressure, hepatomegaly, and watery diarrhea. Okay. And you can see these are the different manifestations in case of uh, in this uh, refeeding syndrome. Can you see that hypophosphatemia, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, thiamine deficiency, all can be associated. Thiamine deficiency, all can be associated. But the question was related to CHF-like features. Can you see that in hypophosphatemia, the cardiac manifestation, can you see that? Decreased stroke volume and hypotension, which are uh, going to result in, which are the features of cardiac failure. So decreased stroke volume can be a feature of cardiac failure associated with hypophosphatemia in the setting of refeeding syndrome. If you see the next two things, Hypokalemia and hypomagnesemia cardiac manifestation occur, but it is in the form of arrhythmia and not in the form of heart failure. Okay, so that is why the answer for this question is hypophosphatemia. And again, I have told you one more point also. If they ask you what is the hallmark feature of refeeding syndrome, please answer as hypophosphatemia only. Okay, right. So that's about this particular question. Moving on to the next one. You are explaining about the transient abnormal myelopoiesis in a child with Down syndrome to patient's relatives. Which of the following is a true statement? You should all know that this is a condition called, uh, there is a condition called transient abnormal myelopoiesis, TAM. It was previously called by the name transient myeloproliferative disorder, but that name is now changed to transient abnormal myelopoiesis. Okay, what is the true statement? Let us start from the last option. Those with transient abnormal myelopoiesis have less risk of developing leukemia later. It is not at all so. They have an increased risk of developing leukemia in future. So that's a wrong state. All require intensive chemotherapy. They don't require intensive chemotherapy. In fact, what is recommended for transient abnormal myelopoiesis is support to manage. They may require something like blood transfusion, but they don't usually require intensive chemotherapy. Less than 1% neonates with Down syndrome have TAM. This is a wrong statement because at least 10% of the neonates with Down syndrome have transient abnormal myelopoiesis. So what is the answer for the question? It is GATA1 mutations are seen in blast of transient abnormal myelopoiesis. This is a true statement. In fact, not only transient abnormal myelopoiesis, even in leukemia, suppose a Down syndrome child develops leukemia, there will be presence of blast. In that blast also, GATA1 mutations are noted. So that is an important statement for you to know. Some quick points about Down syndrome and the hematological problems is they have an increased risk of leukemia than in the general population. This is very important. All of you know about it. There is a 15 to 20 fold increased risk of leukemias in Down syndrome compared to general population. That is number one point. Number two, ratio of ALL to AML in patients with Down syndrome is same as that of the general population. What is the meaning? In general population, we know that compared to ALL and AML, which is more common, ALL is more common. Similarly, in Down syndrome also, ANL is more common compared to AML. Okay. The only one exception which you have to remember is, in the first three years of life, there is a special type of leukemia which develops, which is AML M7. What is that AML M7? It is nothing but acute. Yes, megakaryocytic leukemia. Mega karyocytic leukemia. This is important. Please remember this point. Generally, Down syndrome, ALL is more common than AML. But in the first three years of life, acute mega karyocytic leukemia, which is a type of AML, is more common compared to the AL. That should be remembered. Okay. So these are some of the important points related to uh, Down syndrome leukemia risk. Okay. That should be remembered. Okay. Then 
EEG that demonstrates electrocerebral silence over how many minutes supports the diagnosis of brain death. Brain death is always one of the favorite topics. Okay, right? you must be, you must have seen them in your previous questions also. It is repeated this time also. But this time they ask about the specific point: how much of electrocerebral silence? Electrocerebral silence is nothing but no EEG tracing over how many minutes? Yes, answer is. Anybody wants to answer this? Electrocerebral silence over how many minutes is suggestive of this particular uh, brain death? Any comments? 10 minutes, 30 minutes, 1 hour or 6 hours? Answer is 30 minutes. Answer is definitely 30 minutes. Okay. A few points about brain death you have to remember is brain death is a condition characterized by irreversible cessation of all brain functions including brain stem function. Everything is uh, has coming to an end, then it is what is called as brain death. Okay. And it is usually due to trauma. That is what we call it as traumatic brain injury, TBI. That is the most common reason for brain death in young children. And brain death, three components should be satisfied. These are the primary criteria. What is the first one? Demonstration of irreversible coma with a known cause. Second is brain stem reflexes should be absent. Third is apnea. These are the three essential things for certifying brain death. That should be remembered. Actually, what we are talking about in this question was EEG. Okay, that EEG is only an additional test or an ancillary test. Actually, there are two ancillary tests. One is EEG, where I have already told you at least 30 minutes of no EEG tracing, you will call it as brain death. One more is CBF. What is that? Cerebral blood flow studies, where we use radionuclide substances. And the cerebral blood flow is decreased, or uh, sorry, cerebral blood flow is absent. That is when we call it as brain death also. But please remember, these are only additional tests. The main test, uh, the, the main ones are demonstration of irreversible coma, absent brain cell reflexes, and third one is apnea. That's what you should remember. Okay. So that's about this one. Then we move on to the next condition. A five-year-old child suddenly develops a sore throat and fever. Within a matter of hours, the patient becomes toxic. Swelling is, uh, swallowing is difficult, that is dysphagia with drooling. Along with that, he is also having labored breathing. The neck is hyperextended and child assumes a tripod posture. On x-ray, there was a thumb sign of the following, the most likely diagnosis. This is something which all of you should be knowing the answer. Any answer for this particular question? Toxic appearance with the dysphagia, hyperextended neck with a classical tripod posture. This I think all of you should be able to say and x-ray shows the thumb sign. Which condition is that? Yes, it's going to be, yes, very straightforward one, acute epiglottitis. You all know that acute epiglottitis is one of the most serious infections of the larynx. Another close differential would be laryngotracheobronchitis, but here the child is not toxic, child won't be toxic. An x-ray will show the characteristic finding. What is that finding? You will get a steeple sign. You will get steeple sign. This is important. You'll get steeple sign in case of Acute learning or tracheal brown. So this is one of the straightforward questions. I don't think much of discussion is needed. Okay. Moving on to the next one. A child presents with features of Alport syndrome with macro thrombocytopenia. This disorder is due to mutation. It's a very straightforward question. Okay. Alport syndrome is always a favorite topic for the examiners to ask you. Yes. Anybody wants to comment on this? It is definitely a collagen defect. So that is why it's going to be one of the three, first to three options. Collagen 4A1. Call 4A5 or call 4A6. Which is the answer? It's a direct question. Yes, it is call 4A5. What is that? It is type 4 collagen. Type 4 collagen. A5 means alpha 5 chain. That is a characteristic gene defect associated with Alport syndrome. That should be remembered. Now remember, Alport syndrome is considered as a hereditary nephritis. With the X-linked inheritance, as I told you, call 4 a 5 is the most common one. Other genes can also be implied in this condition, but it is in the autosomal forms of this condition. Autosomal forms are generally less common. Can you see 85% is X-linked only? Only very few are autosomal forms. Autosomal forms have gene defect in the other ones. What is it? Call 4 a 4 as well as call 4 a 5 That is something. Sorry, not A5. A3. Okay. These are the other gene defects, but most common and the answer for the question is call for A5. Okay. Other features of this condition include renal in the form of nephritis. That's what we are discussing. 
sensory neural hearing loss as well as anterior lenticornis. And you all know that the presence of anterior lenticornis, that is forward protrusion of the lens, is supposed to be pathognomonic of Alport syndrome. This is very important. It is pathognomonic of Alport syndrome. These are the must-know points related to Alport syndrome. This time it was a gene-related question, but it's a multiple time repeatedly asked question. So keep a note of this. A child presents with the following abnormalities. Which of the following is a correct statement regarding this finding? First of all, tell me what is that finding which is given in the question, the picture. You cannot see that. There is something like a keyhole defect in the lower part of this iris. What is that defect called? Yes, it is called as a coloboma. You all know that it is nothing but the coloboma of the iris which is given in this particular question. Which is a correct uh, regarding this particular finding. Mostly located superiorly. Is it a correct statement? Not at all. It's located inferior. Can you see that? It is inferior. Most often it's inferiorly. That's why it produces something like a uh, keyhole appearance. Okay. Keyhole appearance. Does not involve the fundus and the optic nerve. Absolutely wrong statement. Some of these findings are associated with uh, coloboma involving the fundus as well as the optic nerve. So that is why all children with coloboma, you should do a thorough ophthalmological evaluation. So that is for the same reason, the last option, no need for further evaluation is also a wrong statement. Please keep that in mind. So what should be the answer for the question after rolling out all the option? It is frequently transmitted as autosomal dominant trait. That is what you should remember. Okay, right? See, this is one uh, section given in Nelson textbook of pediatrics it's like a small section so they are asking questions from almost every part of Nelson textbook so please keep Nelson textbook as your basis for preparation don't miss out on any of these topics especially we tend to miss out on these topics like uh, um, the eye abnormalities ear abnormalities and all but every year after year INA SS questions are picked up from these topics as well so please keep a note of that and read those topics also properly okay that's about this particular question. Moving on to the next one, which is a case scenario type question. It's a repeat exam question. Eight month old child diagnosed to have systemic JIA, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, one month ago and is in remission with the treatment. Today he present with high spiking fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly, purpura, as well as encephalopathy. Lab evaluation reveals thrombocytopenia, hypofibrinogenemia with elevated liver enzymes and low ESR. Of the following, the most likely diagnosis. Flare of the systemic disease, hemophagocytic lymphocytosis, autoimmune hepatitis, familial triglyceridemia. I think some of you can attempt this particular question. This is a repeat exam question. What is that? See, systemic onset JAA is not a very common type, but still a severe type of JA. You all know about it. Now here, the presentation is entirely different. What is that? High spiking fever, lymphadenopathy, hepatosplenomegaly with purpura and encephalopathy, meaning it's a dangerous condition. Okay, I got some answer for this question already. Very good. This is hemophagocytosis. Very good. Okay, right. And the key features which will point to hemophagocytosis in this particular question are, in addition to the clinical features which I have already told you, these are the lab findings. And important lab findings include these ones. What are they? Hypofibrinogenemia, low fibrinogen along with low ESR. In fact, low fibrinogen noted in this condition is the reason for low ESR noted in this particular condition as well. Okay. So answer is going to be hemophagocytic lymphohistiocytosis. There is an another name for this condition. It's also called MAS. What is that? Macrophage activation syndrome. A rare complication but potentially fatal complication of systemic onset GE. Please remember, this complication can occur during any time of treatment in SA. It can occur at the time of onset. It can occur during remission or during treatment itself. Okay, Any time it can occur. That is the most important thing. And you have to differentiate this macrophage activation syndrome or lymphocytic hemophagocytosis from the usual systemic flare of, uh, flare of systemic uh, J. So, when will you suspect MAs? This is an important clinical question. One. Change in the pattern of fever and rash. If you see systemic onset JA, they will have intermittent fever. They have intermittent fever. But in macrophage activation syndrome, they have continuous fever, persistent fever. That is important. Okay. Systemic onset JA is an evanescent rash. Okay. It's an evanescent rash. But in uh, macrophage activation syndrome, there will be 
persistent rash continuous placental rash this is important next is there will be drop in the cell count especially thrombocytopenia because in systemic onset as a part of inflammation there can be inflammatory thrombocytosis but in macrophage activation you know, there will be decrease in the cell that is important and third but not the least in, uh, last but not the least is the most important one which is low ESR I told you it is already due to low fibrinogen causes low ESR in this particular condition so this is something which is very very important and the lab criteria for uh, macrophage activation syndrome includes increased ferritin along with okay, clinical criteria is fever along with this any two of the following criteria what are they two increase and two decrease what is that two decrease would include thrombocytopenia and low fibrinogen two increase would include increased ASE as well as increased triglyceride these are the findings which will tell you that it's a macrophage activation syndrome and putting a start for this because this is a repeatedly asked exam question be it an INASS question or an ETXS question these questions are repeatedly being asked okay so that's about this particular question we move on to the next one in enzyme replacement therapy the patient's antibody response does not affect the treatment efficacy in which of the following conditions Sorry. can you see all the options are metabolic disorders pompies PKU Fabry Fabry's disease and Gaucher's disease now the question is first of all we need to know where ERT is available pompies disease ERT is available Fabry ERT is available Gaucher disease ERT is available it is not available for phenylketonuria okay that point should be clear question is patient's antibody response does not affect the treatment efficacy this is something which you have to remember okay and this is one of the important limitations of enzyme replacement therapy also whenever we start the treatment the patient's and uh, patient's body will start producing antibodies against this replaced enzyme okay that will make the treatment to be ineffective question is where antibody response will not affect the treatment efficacy it's not directly given in Nelson textbook so I looked up one of the research articles which says very clearly uh, it is titled like this antibody response in patients with Gaucher's disease after repeated infusion with glucose cerebrocellular you all know that this is the uh, enzyme deficient in Gaucher's disease and they have given a very very specific point here that presence of GCR antibodies that means uh, glucocerebrosidase antibodies in the patient did not appear to affect the efficacy of therapy in any of the patient treated till date okay so that is why the answer for this question is going to be Gaucher's disease you should also know one more point Gaucher's disease is the first disease for which enzyme replacement therapy was available itself okay so these are two important one-liner questions which you should be knowing about okay so that's about this particular one next one was related to Craniopharyngioma. About craniopharyngioma, which is incorrect statement. Chemotherapy is the treatment of choice. Absolutely wrong statement because in craniopharyngioma, surgery is the treatment of choice. In fact, if you see Nelson textbook, it is clearly mentioned there is no role for chemotherapy in craniopharyngioma. Radiotherapy may have an additional role, but surgery is the primary mode of management in craniopharyngioma. That itself is the answer for the question. Papillary craniopharyngioma subgroup is a common type of children. That's a correct statement. Actually, there's one more type of CP also. CP means craniopharyngioma here called adamantinomas. Adamantinomatous craniopharyngioma. But that is common in adults. Okay, that is common in adults. Children with CP often presents with endocrine abnormalities. That's a true statement. They have delayed puberty as an association. Distant metastasis is uncommon. That is also a true statement. Um, that's also a true statement because they are only locally invasive tumors. They are only locally invasive tumors. They are only locally invasive tumors. Um, just a minute. I am getting some comments. I'll just read it out. What was that? Papillary CP subgroup is common in children. What was that? Okay, okay, okay. Oh, okay, okay. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry. Yeah, correct. What can you see? Papillary sub... Okay, okay. Right. This is not a subgroup in children actually. It is a subgroup which is commonly seen in adults. Was that the option given in this particular question? Anybody wants to contribute? Yeah. 
I'm sorry for this. Uh, this was the uh, okay. Right, right, right. I'm sorry. So please make a change here. Adamantinomatous CP is common in children. Papillary CP subgroup is common in adults. Sorry for that. Okay, right. So please make that change. Actually, this was the option. Papillary CP group is common in adults. That's the correct statement. Adamantinolitis pryniferangioma uh, is common in children. So this option should have been like this. Papillary CP subgroup is common in adults. Okay, right. Yeah, yes. Okay, right. So just make a note of it. So this is about craniopharyngioma. Now craniopharyngioma, you all know that it's one of the low grade tumors, which is WHO grade one tumor, and location is in the supra cellar region. It is in the supracellular region. Usually is located in the supracellular region. Two histological subtypes subtypes are there. As I already told you, adamantinovitis CP is common in children and papillary CP is common in adults. They often have endocrine and visual problems. You all know that it, this is a, a tumor mass which can cause compression and can be associated with visual field defects as well. Okay. And it's a minimally invasive tumor. And that is why it's considered under WHO grade 1 tumors. And as I've already told you, surgery is the primary treatment. For large tumors, you can go with radiotherapy as an additional treatment. But chemotherapy has no role in the management of craniopharyngioma. Okay, please make a note of that. Fine. Next is yet another important and interesting question. Try to answer this. This pattern of question, that is what I was telling you. Around three, four questions were related to chronic diarrhea, steatoria pattern of question. So that is why I'm telling you, uh, whenever you have time, please go for the prospect to PG aspirants, uh, that super specialty aspirants, please go through that particular chapter of Nelson textbook thoroughly because questions are expected in future also. A 25-month-old girl was admitted to hospital because of stools that are pale, foul-smelling, bulky and heavy and also has short stature. Pale, bulky, foul-smelling stools will tell you that it is a case of Steatoria. Okay, correct? Steatoria. At the age of three months, she presented with convulsions as well as neutropenia. Since then, she had frequent purulent otitis media and pneumonia. This can be a direct uh, uh, consequence of neutropenia. Child is suffering from repeated infections. She also has angular stomatitis and dental caries as a part of nutrient deficiencies it can occur. Results of lab studies are as follows. This is the area where I didn't get any Clarification properly. But anyway, hemoglobin 11.3, monocyte 22.9, basophils, eosinophils is 0. Platelet count is on the lower side. Of the following, the most likely diagnosis. Any comments? Sure. Here, the main clues are steatoria and neutropenia. Based on which, anybody wants to comment on this? Yes. Okay. Cystic fibrosis can be associated with steatoria. It can be associated with recurrent pneumonia. Can it be the answer for the question? Not at all, because cystic fibrosis is not associated with neutropenias. Okay, right? Cystic fibrosis, no association with neutropenia. So that can be ruled out. Swashman Diamond Syndrome, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, Pearson syndrome. Alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, you all know that it's going to be associated with liver disorders. Okay, it is going to be associated with liver dysfunction as well as when they become older, they will develop emphysemas. It's not going to be associated with steatoria and neutropenia, so that can be ruled out. Pearson syndrome, Schwarzman diamond syndrome, both of them have steatoria as an association. Okay, that should be remembered. However, the differentiating point is neutropenia is very, very strongly associated or correlated with Schwarzman diamond syndrome. Whereas Pearson syndrome, in addition to steatoria, they will have associated anemia and they may require transfusions also, blood transfusions also. Okay. That is how we can differentiate between these two conditions. So the answer for this question is going to be Swarfman Diamond Syndrome. Are you able to follow this? Any of you have any modifications in this question can contribute. Any of you have any modifications in this question can contribute. Okay, so this was the similar pattern of question. Okay, fine. So just a quick look about Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome. It's a condition which is autosomal recessive in inheritance. And this condition is characterized by a triad. This triad is very important and MCQ purposes, this you should know thoroughly. Pancreatic dysfunction, which can manifest as steatoria and fat-soluble vitamin deficiency. Skintal abnormalities, they can have short stature, as well as bone marrow dysfunction, which typically manifests as neutropenia. And in some cases, you can have pancytopenia as well. Now, 
this is the line which I was discussing before also. Schwarzman Diamond Syndrome is differentiated from the Pearson Syndrome in that Pearson Syndrome is characterized by uh, vacuolated erythropoietic precursors. So main feature of this condition would be anemia which requires blood transfusions. That is a point to be noted. Pancreatic fibrosis rather than fatty replacement of pancreatic tissue. This is something more like a histological differentiation. Okay. PSN syndrome, there is pancreatic fibrosis noted, whereas fatty replacement of pancreatic tissue is seen in Schwarzman Diamond syndrome. And third important differentiating point is lack of skeletal abnormalities, like short stature and all, cannot be a feature of this PSN syndrome. Okay. So, key word of difference between the two conditions is both can be associated with pancreatic exocrine insufficiency or steatoria, but Schwarzman Diamond syndrome associated neutropenia is a must. Associated skeletal abnormalities in the must, whereas Pearson syndrome, there will be associated anemia and absence of skeletal abnormalities. That should be remembered. Okay. That will be the differentiating point between the two conditions. Next one is a factual type of question. Apple peel appearance is seen in which type of jejunoiliar atresia? First of all, remember there are five types of jejunoiliar atresia. Please have a look at this picture. Five types of jejunoiliar atresia type 1, type 2. Type 3A, type 3B, and type 5, type 4. So that is contributing to the yeah. five types of jejunoiliar attrition. Can you see that? And out of this, some facts I will tell you first itself. Type 2 and type 3A are the most common types. Okay, type 2 and type 3 are the most common types. Can you see? Uh, now the description of that different types. Type 1 is like a continuation is preserved, but it is like a small caliber of the intestine noted in that area. Type 2, there is only a very thin cord-like structure connecting the two segments. Type 3, you can see that there is a discontinuity on both the sides. It's a um, atresia pattern. Type 3 is an extensive atresia pattern. And this is where you can see the terminal parts of ileum is attached to the cecum itself. Okay, right? And can you see that appearance? It is like this. This is what we call it as an apple peel appearance. Okay. And this apple peel appearance is a characteristic of type 3B, which will be the answer for this particular question. Type 4 is characterized by multiple atresia. That means atresia at multiple levels. So the answer for this question is going to be type 3B, where you have the apple peel appearance. This is a diagrammatic representation of that apple peel. You can see that. And a clinically important point is that this type of type 3B jejunal atresia, the ileum, receives blood supply from ileocolic artery. This is important, important surgical consideration which you should keep in mind. Okay, there is a separate blood supply to this part of the segment of the ileum. That should be remembered. Okay, so anyway, the answer for this question is type 3B where you have the apple peel appearance. Okay, right. Moving on to the next question. This is yet another repeat question asked in your previous INISS exam. Last year INISS was this question again asked. Seven week old infant under evaluation for cholestasis. Examination reveals a triangular face with a broad forehead, deep set ears, prominent ears, straight nose with a bulbous tip and a pointed chin. Echocardiography shows peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. You can have three important clues in this question. One is Cholestasis evidence is present. Second is abnormal facies like triangular facies and multiple abnormalities are noted. Third is peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis. Anybody wants to comment on what is the diagnosis? Zenvigus, allegedly neonatal hemochromatose, hemochromatosis or agonist syndrome. Any answer? Okay, of this, the most important syndromic association with cholestasis. I am giving you the clue already. Most important syndromic association with cholestasis. What it could be? Very good. The answer? I got some of the answers already. Yes. Yes. Very good, Dr. Uday Kumar. Very correct. It is a case of allegedly syndrome. Okay. One of the favorite examiner's topics. Allegedly syndrome. Okay. Whatever I have marked in the questions are the clues for this particular answer. Okay. Right. So please make a note of it. Allegedly syndrome, as I told you, is one of the important, important syndromic associations of cholestasis associated with jagged one defect. And the gene name has been asked in your exam previously. What is that? JAG1 gene defect. This is important. It's a JAG1 gene defect. That is important. It's a condition characterized by bile duct positive, where there is a 
decreased uh, number of bile ducts in the liver and the biliary system. That is what should be remembered. And this condition typically has this characteristic faces. Can you, faces. Can you see that? It is a broad forehead with a pointed chin giving rise to that of a triangular appearance. Can you see though? A triangular facial appearance is very characteristic. The tip of the nose is bulbous tip. That was given already in the question. It's a bulbous tip, which is again very characteristic. Facial appearance is very, very important, which will be almost like diagnostic of this particular condition. In addition to facial appearance, there are two more things which you have to keep in mind. What is it? Vertebral defects, typically in the form of hemivertebra. That is important. Typically in the form of hemivertebra. That's a characteristic association. Then one more, one more important thing is this finding. What is this? It is posterior embryo toxin. When all these findings are noted, you should make a diagnosis of allergy syndrome. As you can see, when I go back to the question, the features are already given. What are they? Triangular face, cholestasis, and of course, the cardiac association is peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis only. That is also characteristic of this condition making it the diagnosis as allegedly syndrome. It is one of your previous year topics. So please keep that in mind. It can be repeated again in your exams as well. Okay, right. Then moving on to the next one. What is the most frequent lesion associated with neurofibromatosis type 1? This is a very basic question. I expect most of you to answer this one. What is that answer? Optic nerve glioma, bilateral vestibular schwannoma, spinal tumors and intracranial meningioma, which is the most frequent lesion associated with neurofibromatosis type 1. Very good. It's a straightforward one. Optic nerve glioma, NF1. Whereas if you see schwannomas, they are associated with what? Neurofibromatosis 2. It's a very basic level question, which has been previously asked also and you should be knowing about it. Uh, just a quick recap of findings in neurofibromatosis type 1. You all know that it's a condition characterized by um, loss of function mutation in the NF1 G. You all know about it. And coming to the clinical findings, it is very important. Cephalae patches, cephalae patches or cephalae macules, they are seen in 100%. Almost all patients with NF1 will have cephalae matches, patches or the cephalae macules. Please keep a note of that size also. What is that? If it is a prepubertal patient, it is more than 5 millimeter in size. And if it is postpubertal patient, it should be more than 15 millimeter in size and remember not just one cephalia macule, at least six or more cephalia macules should be present. This is important. Next is of course neurofibroma, two or more neurofibroma or one big neurofibroma or a plexiform neurofibroma. Then axillary and groin speckling. You can see the question is in optic glioma, two or more lish nodules in the iris. You all know that these are the brown nodules in the iris and osseous lesions, kental lesions in the form of pseudoarthrosis, typhoscoliosis like that and a first degree relative having neurofibromatosis type 1. Now, there are at least, you can see that there are so many criteria, seven things are given. Can anybody tell at least how many of the seven should be present to be called as neurofibromatosis type 1? At least two out of seven of this criteria should be present. Then only you can call it as NF type 1. This is very, very important. So please keep a note of this. Always neurocutaneous syndromes. I see that in every INA SS or um, a NEAT SS exam, one sure question from neurocutaneous syndromes are there. So that particular section of Nelson is very, very important. It is line to line picked up from Nelson textbook of pediatrics only. Okay. So should make a note of it. Okay. Moving on to the next question. It's a very straightforward question. What is it? All are seen in tumor lysis syndrome, Excel. This also, I think many of you should be able to tell the answer. Hyperkalemia, hyperuricemia, hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia. What is your answer? Straightforward one. Yes, it's even asked at, a, uh, I mean, PG level question also. Even for PG entrances also, this question is commonly asked. Many of you should be knowing the answer. What is that answer? Yes, it is not hypercalcemia. It is hypocalcemia. And the reason for hypocalcemia is hyperphosphatemia itself, which will form complexes with the calcium, decreasing the level of calcium in the blood itself. Okay, right? So answer is not hypercalcemia, it is hypocalcemia, repeatedly asked exam question. Okay, moving on to the next one. A four-year-old uh, white girl had a low-grade fever, intermittent crampy abdominal pain with emesis and swollen knees for three days. There is a petechial rash on the lower extremity Kidney biopsy was done. What is the diagnosis? I think this is also a pretty straightforward diagnosis. Many of you should be able to 
know the answer by this time. What is the end? The key features which will help in formulating a diagnosis are abdominal pain, knee involvement along with rash, petechial rash in the lower extremity. Which one should be the answer? Very good. The answer is going to be Henoch Schonlein Purpura, HSP. It is Henoch Schonlein Purpura. Okay. See, if you see the other options, Kawasaki disease, there is no reason for you to do a kidney biopsy in Kawasaki disease. Nobody does that, right? There's no direct association with Kawasaki disease and kidney. Acute hemorrhagic edema of infancy, it should be the name itself. It's a, sorry, it should be infancy. Acute hemorrhagic edema is a condition of infancy, which should be in a child less than one year of age, but here it is four-year-old child, so that can be ruled out. Meningococcemia, they can have a decay brush, but there is no reason for this abdominal pain and swelling knees and all. But even if they have fever also, it is not going to be low-grade fever. Meningococcemia should be high-grade fever. Child will be very toxic, okay? So all that can be ruled out. Answer is going to be henoch Shondine Purpura. You all know that henoch Shondine Purpura is one of the common vasculitic disorders in children. And there is a classification criteria for HSP also. All of you should be knowing that what is the most essential criteria for HSP? Without any doubt, palpable purpura involving the lower limbs. Without any doubt, there should be palpable criteria. Along with that, the additional findings would be like this. Abdominal pain, arthritis or arthralgia, biopsy shows IgA deposits. Okay, can you recollect in this question, kidney biopsy was done. And the reason for kidney biopsy to be done is to look for IgA deposits. And the characteristic finding is also called leukocyto. Plastic vasculitis, leukocytoclastic vasculitis with IgA deposits. Renal involvement typically is in the form of nephritis. Okay, so along with the purpura, if these findings are present, you can surely make a diagnosis of henoch Schoenling purpura. So in this question, most of the things were given and we can confidently make a diagnosis of HSP. One last question. HSP is what type of vasculitis? Small vessel, large vessel or medium vessel vasculitis? Favorite question. Very good. It's a small vessel vasculitis. It is a small vessel vasculitis. Okay, right. So these are the important points related to henoch schonlein purpura that you should make a note of. And that is about the compilation of questions which I got from the students regarding this INASS. So my concluding remarks are um, usually exam questions for uh, a super specialty level will be of moderate to tough difficulty only. Of course, Nelson is a main textbook which you have to read very properly. Additional resources will be required for your neonatology sections where you have to look at textbooks like Cloherty as well as average textbook on neonatology. And for pediatric intensive care also, you have to look at specialty textbooks. Most of the questions are from the sections and keep a look at the questions and please do contribute to any additional questions or modifications to the questions which have been discussed in this particular session. Okay. I wish you all the best for your upcoming exams and with that, I'm concluding this session. Thank you.